All right, let's get into the word of the Lord. And uh, so very important to uh, teach the word. Amen. Uh, the word is important. We have uh, Acts chapter 26. We're going to read through that. And uh, we're getting close to the end of the book of Acts. I think there's only 28 chapters in here. Uh, but the beautiful part about the book of Acts, it doesn't say amen at the end of it. And so uh, you and I are living the book of Acts right now. You are living the book of Acts. You are in God's time of peace, and he's looking through time. And we are all living uh, the book of Acts right now. And so what you do with the book of Acts is so important. And we appreciate the book of Acts. Amen. Uh, so we're going to go to Acts chapter 26. Start reading verse number 1. Amen. And, uh, and there's so much to learn here. But hopefully we can teach uh, the good word of God to you. And then Agrippa said to Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. <clears throat> I think myself happy, King of Virgo, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear, my, hear me patiently. What manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation of Jerusalem, now all the Jews. Which do be from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest set of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand in an and judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. And to which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should we thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I barely thought of myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them of any to comply them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests. Midday, O king, I saw the way of light from the heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around about me and them on which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, who thou persecuted. <clears throat> but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and witness, spoke of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. And that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are set, sanctified by the faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I said first unto them of the Damascus and Jerusalem, throughout all the coast of Judea, and among them the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works meet for repentance. For these times the Jews caught me in the temple, and went about to kill me. 
Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. That Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. Do you agree with believeth thou the promise? I know that thou shalt believe it. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had to appeal unto Caesar. All right, so King Agrippa uh, was uh, king over the various territories northeast of uh, the Galilee, and uh, one of his jobs was, of course, to appoint the high priest. So he was very adept at spiritual matters. He knew about the law, he knew about the law of Moses, he knew about the prophets, he knew about the prophecies of Jesus Christ, he knew about Jesus Christ being born in Bethlehem, he knew about him running away to Egypt, he knew about him coming back to Galilee, he knew about his ministry. Uh, King Agrippa knew a lot about Jesus Christ and about the apostles. And that was part of his job, uh, to know all the things about the Jews. And uh, so not only did he appoint high priest, uh, but he was also in charge of the temple treasury. And uh, so uh, he was also in charge of the garments that the priests wore. And so he handled the money. Uh, he was uh, appointed by um, the emperor, a very important, uh, I believe it was Antipas, uh, descendant of Herod. And so, uh, as we look at this man, King Agrippa, he was very smart, uh, but he was no doubt a little bit political. And unfortunately, uh, he missed the, the points just like Festus did. Remember last week, uh, we studied and Festus was trying to get money out of Paul. He knew that Paul had a good following. He thought, well, they could take up an offering and give me lots of money, and I would let Paul loose. Uh, but uh, Paul would not allow any such thing to happen uh, uh, to free himself, uh, he uh, appealed to Caesar, of course. Uh, and now uh, King Agrippa is now sitting in judgment, and the reason why he's there is because he's trying to find out what Paul did wrong. Because he's getting ready to go to Caesar Augustus and, uh, for a big trial in Rome, and nobody knows what he did wrong. <laughs> the Jews are accusing him of this and that, which they could not prove any of it. And so now uh, uh, there was a big problem. And so he asked King Agrippa, if you would, I know you know a lot about the Jews, so if you just sit and listen to this man, and then after you listen to him, you can tell him what the charges are and what uh, we should tell uh, Augustus. So uh, this is kind of a, uh, he's appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar is going to go because he's a Roman citizen, he has that right. Uh, so uh, he appears, Agrippa and Bernice, the wife, 
and uh, with no doubt great pomp, and uh, you know, as a king would and a queen, uh, they came in, and Paul uh, looks at Agrippa, Agrippa looks at Paul, and he said, okay, now you can speak for yourself in the first verse there. And so Paul did stretch forth his hand and begin to speak, and I like what he said. He said, I, I'm happy today. You know, in the past, I talked to people that weren't very smart about the law. They weren't very smart about this, and they weren't very smart about that. And they really didn't know what was going on uh, with the Jewish nation, but you do. And so uh, I'm especially happy because I know in verse 3, he says, you are an expert in all. Everybody say all. Oh. In all questions and all uh, things among the Jews. Wherefore, I ask you to hear me patiently. You know, sometimes people don't do that. And as, uh, as a human being, uh, sometimes I'll listen to people, but I don't hear everything they're saying to me. Have you ever been guilty of that? They're talking, but you're thinking about something else. Maybe about what you're going to say return. I remember uh, listening to some ladies talk one time, and, and men do the same thing. But before the lady got the full statement out, other lady was answering the question before she knew exactly. She thought she knew exactly, and, and nobody's completing sentences. Nobody's hearing anybody out. They're just going back and forth and back and forth. And uh, so Paul was saying here, now, I want you to focus in on this. You are an expert. I want you to put your thinking cap on and realize where I'm coming from. And verse 4, my manner of life from my youth, which first among my own nation in Jerusalem, I know all the Jews. I know everybody. I'm, I'm, I was an important person in Jerusalem. I knew everybody. I knew everybody that was important. I knew all the, the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify. So some of them are not willing to accept him now. They knew him before, but now that he's converted to, uh, to Christianity and left the law behind, uh, they don't want much to do with him. Uh, but here he said, I was the strictest sect of religion. I lived a Pharisee. So uh, he, the Pharisees were probably the best of the two. The Sadducees, you know, as we said before, they were Sadducee because they did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. So, uh, where would we be today if we were Sadducees? You know, even among uh, the law, there were people that knew were closer to the truth and people that were further from the truth. It's just like in Christianity today. What, what the world calls Christianity, some are a lot closer than others to the truth. In this case, the Sadducees were way away from the truth. And Apostle Paul, as a Pharisee, uh, even though he didn't accept Jesus as Messiah, he was still close, closer to God and closer to the truth. Now he said, even though I'm a Pharisee and I believe in the resurrection of the dead, I believe in angels. How many of you believe in the resurrection of the dead? All right, everybody. I like that. And how many of you believe in angels? Praise God. Amen. So we're, we're really close. We're kind of like Paul. Now, he said, unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly served God day and night? For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. So he's looking at him and he said, because I'm a Pharisee and I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, there's a difference in believing in the resurrection of somebody. Because a lot of people were raised from the dead in the Old Testament. Uh, there was lots of people that were raised from the dead. People were healed of uh, leprosy. Uh, people were healed of a lot of things. Uh, miracles, signs, and wonders in abundance in the Old Testament. And so he said, why should it be a thought and incredible with you that God should raise the dead? He's done it before. You know that. You're an expert. But that's why they're trying to kill me, is because I'm saying that Jesus of Nazareth, in verse 9, is risen from the dead. Uh, which thing also I did in Jerusalem. So he said, I used to hate uh, Christians. I used to persecute them. I even had 
had him thrown in jail. I had him put to death in verse 10. And I gave my voice against them. I punished them often in synagogues. And I, I, I compelled them by no doubt beating them uh, to blaspheme and say they weren't really Christians. And being exceedingly mad at them, I persecuted them even into strange cities. So uh, here, uh, here's a man that is highly motivated and very proactive, but he's going in the wrong direction. Uh, you meet people in the world today that they are really motivated. They're really on fire, but it's not the right kind of fire. Amen. We need to make money. We need to be industrious. We need to do those things, but we have to put God somewhere in there in first place. Yes. Amen. I know I need food. I know I need a house. I know I need cars. I know I need all those things, but somewhere on the line, I have to put God in there. Amen. So he was misguided and misdirected. Consequently, he was fighting against God. And I think maybe I might have been there at one point in my life where I was doing all the wrong things, going to all the wrong places with all the wrong people and being involved in all the wrong things. But then God got a hold of me. Praise God. There is always that change, that life-changing experience that you get when you meet Jesus Christ. So in verse 12, Whereupon I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. And at midday, O king, so he's calling on the king. He said, I did all these bad things, and I hated Christians. But at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. It wasn't a light from hell. Many people get confused. Uh, they think that, uh, you know, some Christians are not really from God. They're really a cult, or there's some other mixed-up people. And believe me, Paul was not a cult. He was not a mixed-up person. He had it right. He was smarter than everybody that he ever met when it comes to salvation and it comes to religion. He said, I saw a light that was brighter than the sun come down shining right about me. And then the journey with me, they saw the light. But they did not hear the voice, of course. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why are you a persecutor without me? So he's saying, uh, why are you going the wrong direction in your life? God spoke to me one day and he said, you know, if you keep going this direction with your wife and children, they will eventually belong to that group of people. What you need to do is turn around and go back to your roots. Go back to Pentecost. Go back to your roots and get back in the church and, and get the Holy Ghost and live your life for God and bring your family back to God. And so uh, he said, it's hard for you to, uh, to do this, isn't it? In other words, uh, when I was out there in the world, and God was trying to draw me into the church, I was fighting against it. I was fighting against it. And one day I came home from work, and Sister Cindy was sitting down at the coffee table reading the Bible, a former Roman Catholic. Well, that's a little unusual. I was shocked. And I looked at her and I thought, you know what, it wasn't too many years ago, my sister-in-law wanted to give her life to God, and my brother didn't. And then my brother wanted to give his life to God, and my sister-in-law changed her mind, and she didn't. And so they didn't, and they ended up getting a divorce. And I got to thinking, my wife may be a little hungrier than I am right now, but because I'm smart enough to see it, tells me that God is dealing with me too. And he's letting me know, if you let this opportunity pass, uh, your marriage is not going to work out very good. Well, I didn't realize all that at the time. Uh, but I, I gave my heart to God. 
but he said it's hard for you to kick against the brick. So what did he mean by that? Amen. This is a different time. And this is a different age. And uh, back in the day, when uh, you had an animal that was, uh, you were trying to get to do something, and it didn't do it, and she may hit it with a whip and tell it to get going, and then you maybe close enough, it may just reach back and, and give you a big kick. So what they did is they sharpened sticks. They took a long pole and they put, make it sharp, a little bit pointed, maybe not too pointed, but just enough to hurt. And uh, so when the animals tried to kick back, they would be kicking against the prick, that little needle point on the end of the stick. And uh, Jesus is telling Paul in a terminology, in a, in a way that he understands he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Because it's hurting you, and you're kicking. It's hard. And so he, he gets to thinking, you know, whoever's doing this to me, I mean, you're walking down the road with a bunch of gang of guys, and someone knocks you to the ground, and you see a great light, and, and you hear a voice, but you don't see anybody. Uh, I would say that's going to get your attention, wouldn't you? That'd get my attention. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. In other words, you're going the wrong way. You're going with the people of the world. You're going in a different direction than I want you to go. And I'm asking you to turn around. And your life is not going to go pretty until you do. He said, who are you? Oh, no, I'm Jesus. <laughs> oh, boy. And now I know who... Who's the one that's in charge of knocking you to the ground? You know, when you're an adult male, very strong, and you're walking down the road and something knocks you down, you're going to know that that's a superpower. Amen. Praise God. All right, so uh, Jesus tells you to stand up in 16, verse 16. For I've appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister. So I'm, I'm calling you to preach. You've been going the wrong way. I'm asking you to turn around. And God is doing that to every person on the planet Earth that's going in the wrong direction, living the wrong way. God is saying, I'm expecting you to turn around. And I'm going to use you. Oh, I love it when God uses people. Praise God. He can work miracles with people. Uh, you can take a person that is uh, having a very rough time. They give their life to God. Next thing you know, things are turning around uh, hand over fist. Things are getting better, better, better all the time. I met a farmer one time. He was dying, and he'd been in our church for years. And he told me that, uh, he said, Stanley, when we came into the church, he said, we had the farm, but it was rough. And we were barely making it. And he said, I came into the church, started paying my tithes, and he said, it wasn't long, and just a few years, God began to, the blessings begin to flow. The rain began to come on our crops. The crops began to grow. Amen. And he said, uh, now he's talking, this is an old man that's in his 80s, and he's talking about 50 years of serving the Lord or more. And he said, from the day that I gave my life to God, he said, from that day forward, God blessed me. Amen. When he died, he had a huge farm paid for. Amen. The house was paid for. Everything on it was paid for. He owned all the cattle. A very, very wealthy person. But there he would lay dying and said, I can remember uh, when I was your age and I just came to God. He said, I didn't have much. But he said, God bless me with everything I've got now. And I never will forget that because he died within a week. And my mom and I went to visit him. And in fact, I didn't even know him because he went to another church across town. He used to go to our church, but uh, you know how those things happen sometimes. So, uh, so God is expecting people to turn around. That's why he, he lets things happen to us sometimes uh, to get our attention. It might be somebody you meet at work. It could be somebody you meet on the street. It could be somebody you meet in a store. But God is directing you to himself. And he said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Praise God. God wants to give you rest in your mind. Your mind is wondering what's going on in the world. And why are things so confused? And uh, why am I so confused sometimes? Praise God. Because God has something for you to do. And you have to turn around to go in the other direction. You're going in the wrong direction. Amen. My kids used to keep going in the wrong direction. And I'd reach out there and, <laughs> and had them on the head and said, no, this way, this is where we're going. Now follow me. I'm not following you. You're supposed to follow me. <laughs> Praise God. So he said, you got, I've got a job for you to do in verse 18. I want you to, and here's the clue. This is what all of us are here on earth for. Uh, he said, I've got a job for you to do, Paul, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That's the second chance that God gives all of us. And that's why Jesus died on Calvary, to get forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And Jesus is the one saying this. So he said, well, you have faith in me. You're going to receive what I have for you. And then you're going to go out and do the things that God wants you to do with your life. Hallelujah. Amen. How many of you had, if you had a child, you wanted them to do what you wanted them to do? You would. I mean, sometimes they don't. But boy, when they do, you get real proud. Amen. When you, they do what you tell them to do, it makes you real proud. So in verse 19, he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not uh, disobedient to that heavenly vision, uh, but, I sh but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Everybody say repent. repent. Repent means to about face. Amen. You're walking along here. You're going the wrong direction. And repent means about face. Lord March. You're going towards hell. You need to turn around and go back the other way towards heaven. Can you say amen? Amen. Praise God. Repent and turn to God. And do works meet for repentance. Amen. Well, I'll tell you, I did some works meet for repentance, brother. I mean, I went to see the city detective, and I said, well, uh, Mr. Hannah, I'm sorry for the way that I acted when I was growing up. And do you know what? That man sitting across the table from me in his dining room, I told him that I came and gave my heart to God. I repented of all my sins, and I was coming to him to apologize for the way I acted when I was a child. And this grown man, a detective for the city that I grew up in, he began to weep and cry across the table for me. He said, I never thought I'd see the day when uh, you would turn around. Praise God. But praise God. He saw it. Amen. Praise God. That's exactly what we're here on earth to do. Uh, to recognize uh, that we need to turn around. So he said, I've been hated by a lot of people since then. And uh, he said, I've been able to escape death because they wanted to kill me. It's like I was kept trying to kill others. Now they want to kill me because I had turned on them. And I was now supporting uh, the apostolic Christian Pentecostal movement. And they're mad at me. And they want to get rid of me. And uh, my job is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And look at verse 24. Poor old Festus. Festus, he couldn't take it anymore. Look what he says. He said, Festus, with a loud voice, he says, Oh, thou art beside thyself. Much learning hath made thee mad. Praise God. He thought that Paul was so smart that he ended up being an imbecile. An idiot. A lame brain. But he said, I am not mad, most noble. Look how he did that. I like that. He didn't take it personal. He just denied it. He said, I'm not mad. And then he said, most noble Festus. He didn't call him a dirty dog. Or he didn't say, you nasty old person. Or whatever he could have said, God's going to get you. He just said, I'm not mad, most noble 
fast is. You see how a little bit of kindness along the way can do wonders? But I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. He said, for the king knows, this, verse 26, for the king knows these things before whom I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. In other words, Jesus Christ didn't raise people from the dead. Nobody knew about it. He didn't walk on the Sea of Galilee, which is impossible for human beings to do. Amen. He raised people from the dead. He opened up blinded eyes at people that had withered hands. He brought restored it to where it was just like the other one. Perfect in every possible way. He said, this was not done in a corner. And then they took him out and killed him. Because that's exactly what the prophet said was going to happen to Christ. They were going to kill him. Look at verse 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And here's the sad part of this whole message tonight. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Oh, that's sad. That's so sad. When somebody slips through the fingers of God and the man of God, when they come in and hear the word of God, and then they don't change. They just keep going down the same road that they've always been going down. And they don't take God serious. And they don't take the plan of salvation serious. And they don't take the blood of Jesus Christ serious that was shed on the cross. They don't realize that uh, once a man is born, uh, he will get old. And then he will die. And then after death comes the judgment. Uh, uh, Grimba didn't understand that. He thought he was a king. And his wife, uh, no doubt, thought she was somebody pretty great too. Because they walked out of the house of God was the greatest man that ever preached on the planet earth outside of Jesus Christ. Preached a message to him and the only thing he could say was that almost persuaded me to be Christian. Praise God. So they get up and they start to leave and they were going aside and they talked. Verse 31 between themselves saying this man does nothing worthy of death or bond. See, they got away from the fact about salvation and forgiveness of sins and repenting and turning around and living for God. They got away from that and they went back to their judgment skills. And they went back to that and they said, oh, he hasn't done anything worthy of death. And then said a group unto Festus in verse 32, this man might have been set liberty if he had not appealed to Caesar. So he's going to Rome, Italy, and he's going to stand before uh, the greatest man on earth at the time as far as power in uh, the Gentile world. He's going to stand before Caesar and Caesar's going to judge what to do with him. Unfortunately, in the process of time, uh, Paul was beheaded by Caesar. But in the meantime, he wrote a lot of books in the Bible, did a lot of great things, and he endures even to this day in our mind. And the history tells us that when they uh, uh, took the chains off of him and hit, told him to go to the block to get his head, head cut off, that he ran. He ran to the tree stump, if you will, and he threw his head down on the thing and said, do it now, right now. Because he knew that if, if he was absent from this world, that he would be present with Christ. And church, we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that. Amen. When you die in God, you're going to be with him really quick. Praise God. It's like falling asleep at night. And then you wake up in the morning, you're going to be with Jesus. Amen. It's going to be a great time. Amen. Almost that persuaded me to be a Christian. Sister Carol comes. Altar's open here tonight. If you want to give your life to the Lord, uh, you can come to the altar. You can sit there and pray. You can talk to me after church. But God has a plan for each and every one of us. And he has something for you to do. You say, well, I'm not a very smart person. 
I'm not a very famous person. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of this. I don't have a lot of that. God doesn't care what you are now. He knows what he can make out of you. And God doesn't look at you at what you are today. He looks at what he can make out of you. And God wants to make something very special out of you that are here tonight. And I know that he can and I know he will. Because he loves you. He loves you. And the only thing he wants you to do is recognize that you need to turn from darkness of this world into the marvelous life of Jesus Christ and do your very best to live for God. Praise the Lord.